Today is August 31st, 2022, and my guest is neuroscientist and author Eric Howell of Tufts University. His Substack page is The Intrinsic Perspective, and his novel, uh, The Revelations, deals with consciousness, love, the mystery of the brain. Our topic for today is a recent essay he's written on his Substack page that we will link to, Why I Am Not an Effective Altruist. Eric, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you so much for having me, Russ. So let's start by talking about effective altruism. We've had both Will McCaskill and Peter Singer on the program to discuss it. They're the co-founders of the effective altruism movement. Listeners who pay attention will know that I'm a skeptic of sorts. And like you, I am not an effective altruist, but I think there's some good things about it. Uh, and, I, and you do too. But we'll start with, let's say what it is and what's good about it. Yeah, so I think effective altruism is a, a new movement that is sort of the, the short way to say it would be based off of moral philosophers and funded by billionaires. <laughs> and the idea of it is to create a number of institutions which give, give away money, which is a very admirable thing to do, I think, in general. Everyone, most people agree. Uh, and they do it in a way that they deem effective. So effective altruism. And this is kind of the difference um, between traditional, maybe charity or altruism. And um, if you've seen, say, the movie Moneyball or read the book, uh, where, you know, in, in, in baseball, there is sort of this statistical revolution where they're trying to sort of improve baseball and they realize they don't need really big names. They just sort of need all the statistics to add up and they can do it for much cheaper. Effective altruism at its simplest is sort of just the, the money ball of charity. So it, it, proponents will give examples like you can train a seeing eye dog for a blind person in America for like $40,000. But for that same $40,000, you could prevent 500 cases of, of blindness in the third world. I don't remember what the exact numbers are, That's but okay. those are the sort of examples that they give. And you can see this sort of money ball a aspect to, to the charity. I think in general, everyone, you know, m most people like that, at least to some degree, or they don't mind it. They don't think it's some sort of, uh, Eve, certainly they don't think it's an evil thing or a bad thing. Um, and, and lately they've also become sort of as the, the, the billions have poured in, they've become more, sort of ambitious and the movement have begun to pivot to kind of high profile conceptual issues like AI safety, like uh, long-termism, which is really caring about the deep future of humanity. And again, these things are, I think, good and people mostly agree on them, but the actual core of the philosophy is based, as I said, on these sort of moral philosophers' conceptions of uh, utilitarianism, which is sort of maximizing the good for, for the most number of people with the good defined in some mathematically capturable way. And due to this core of utilitarianism, the movement ends up having sort of a number of repugnant or strange conclusions. And it's not so much that the movement itself is bad, as I think that in order for them to continue to gain mainstream acceptance, they sort of need to leave behind a lot of these more original utilitarian conceptions and basically just become an organization that does cool stuff with billionaires' money. So I just want to expand a little bit on what the movement is and what I like about it, and then we'll get to the utilitarian part. Uh, part of it he didn't emphasize is that it's scientific in, their, in the minds of the effective altruists. You don't just cure 5, 500 people of blindness or prevent 500 cases of blindness, you're going to make sure that your dollar has the biggest bang for the buck and you're going to use, well, actually it's not science, it's social science usually. So it's a little trickier and listeners know I'm skeptical about this, but the idea would be don't do the $40,000 for the, for the uh, seeing eye dog and don't do it because that your uncle was blind and it gives you emotional satisfaction to do that. Make sure that your money has the biggest impact it can possibly have, and that might be preventing blindness in Africa, but it also – in some poor country, or it might also be um, deworming, which was their cause du jour for a long time. I don't know if it still is, but – and the research that underlied, underlay that conclusion was questioned, and it, so it is much more complicated. But the fundamental idea 
that you should care about the impact of your money and not just the warm fuzzies it generates in your uh, laying in bed at night is is an interesting and very thoughtful and, and provocative concept, and I'm I'm very sympathetic to it. And the fact that they care about that is, I think, a good idea, a really and a big idea, and I'm, I think that's great. But I do think it has some um, intellectual problems that it has caused it to somewhat go off the rails. Um, and um, let's let's go into that um, now. You argue in your essay that the, at the heart of effective altruism is Derek Parfit's trolley problem and Peter Singer's shallow pond, two things that have both come up a number of times on Econ Talk, and we'll link to those episodes. Describe what those are to start with, and then tell us why they're problematic. Because on the surface, I mean, who could argue with them, you might think? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that the the tendency to start from simple thought experiments and then to sort of expand upwards into this is how we should, you know, spend billions of dollars, uh, we should immediately wonder if there's some issues of scale or, or concept or complexity there. So the, the, the two sort of motivating thought experiments are, as you said, the trolley problem and the shallow pond. So, so the trolley problem is almost a meme at this point. So a, a lot of people have seen it, but very quickly, there's a trolley going down the tracks. You are near a, a lever that can switch the tracks. And on the track that is going down, there are five people, but you could switch it to a track where there's one people. And then the question is, do you switch the track? Now, a lot of people assume that the correct thing to do is to switch the track. If you actually ask people, a significant minority will say, do not switch the tracks. Like, don't interfere with sort of the natural order. But uh, uh, generally, um, again, this is very dependent on sort of a classically so-called weird dynamics of, you know, Western uh, uh, undergraduates, right? Which is where all these studies are done. But if you ask, if you ask sets of Western undergraduates, you know, wh whether or not to do it, I think it generally ends up being a majority that say to switch, switch the tracks. That is make sure the train only kills one person if otherwise it would kill five. One of the exactly. problems I have with these kind of problems is that there's nothing in life like this. <laughs> and, yeah. and and it's, that sounds like a cheap shot, but it's not. Because it's the same problem with the funding the deworming as if you know for certainty that if you spend this money on this instead of that, the outcome will be this other thing. And usually it's not necessarily clear, but okay, let's play along. Go ahead. Yeah, like it, it's sort of like how, you know, it, in politics, all the non-controversial issues are easy to solve, and therefore they don't crop up in national debate. But then all the controversial issues that can really split people down the middle are exactly the things that, that people run on. Similarly, all the easy to solve trolley problems that have been, you know, that, that are out there in the world have mostly sort of easily been solved. And then <laughs> we're sort of left with the, the, the things that may look like trolley problems, but aren't. But and anyways, the, the the point of this is that, yes, it's better to save uh, five people than, than save one. That's supposedly the point. The problem is we could immediately start to complexify the, the trolley problem. So the, the classic sort of complexification of it that shows the, the problem with the argument is that we can imagine a case of a, a surgeon who has five patients on the edge of organ failure, and then they go out at night hunting and they find some innocent innocent young person and they pull them into an alleyway and they, and they butcher them for their organs. And then they save five of their patients. And I think anyone who's sort of has not completely bit the bullet of, of so-called utilitarianism, which, which would generally advocate for stuff like this, or people would use to describe people who would advocate for stuff like this. Um, most people would find that deeply repugnant. They, they would say, we, we just can't live in a world where, where surgeons pull people in off the streets and kill them. And that is somehow deeply evil and unfair. But the math is the same. It's one person for five. So, so why, why shouldn't you do it? And I, and I, I think rather than thinking um, this is a problem of complexity, we should think, well, maybe this is actually a problem of the, this is actually a problem of simplicity where the trolley problem is just really, really simple. Of course, the other issue would be you sh you're th if forget the rogue surgeon, you are morally obligated after a certain age to show up at the surgeon's office and put yourself up for donation prematurely before you die because you can save five people. And if they're going to be happier than you, the total world happiness, you know, that phrase greatest good for the greatest number of people is so compelling 
Uh, it's got a romantic ring to it. But when you try to figure out what it actually means in real life, it is much, much trickier. So complexifying the trolley problem. Continue. Yeah. And the, so we can sort of immediately see how these these problems, which sort of um, give people the intuitive thought pump to agree with utilitarianism, can quickly be complexified in such a way that the majority of people will now say, wait, wait, wait a minute, something must be wrong, and they throw up their hands. And the whole effective altruism movement, I think, really has a very particular um, intellectual origin, which is in this other uh, this other thought experiment, which is Peter Singer's Shallow Pond, and Peter Singer being uh, a really sort of world famous, one of the top tier uh, co contemporary philosophers. And he wrote uh, an article called Famine, Affluence, and Morality, I think back in the 70s. And in it, this was during a terrible uh, famine, uh, I think in Bengal. And he, he, he gives this analogy, which is that if he's, he's walking to work and he passes a shallow pond and he sees a child drowning in it, he says everyone on earth would wade in to, 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 to pull the child out, right? Like most adults would, would immediately jump to that. But your, your clothes will get muddy, but it's like an inconsequential thing. You'll just pay the dry cleaning bill. But if he then says that, well, maybe the dry cleaning bill could literally save a child, you know, s s somewhere, some, some, some Bengali out there, right, and who's, who's undergoing this famine. And why are you not morally obligated to act on that versus acting to, to, to walk by with, uh, with a child drowning in a shallow pond? And again, I think that it's a, it's a very sort of persuasive thought experiment. I think, I think a lot of people would say, well, you know, when you put it like that, it does seem immediate. Um, Im immediately obvious that maybe I should uh, con consider Bengalis to be sort of proximal to me uh, and, and that my actions can really influence them because they can. All I have to do is click, you know, accept on, on, um, on some credit card charge or something. And, and again, I think that there's very little to sort of ob object to about the particular thought experiment, just like with the trolley problem. I, I personally think that we should sw switch the, the levers in that very particular case. And in the shallow pond, I, I think that it's very obvious that if you can donate a hundred dollars and, and maybe easily save somebody, then maybe you should. But the problem is, is that again, when we sort of change the scale of the thought experiment or complexify it, we immediately run into things that, that don't look good at all. And this was actually an original critique of utilitarianism proposed by uh, another philosopher who was very famous, Derek Parfit. And he proposed this notion called the repugnant conclusion. And the repugnant conclusion is that if, if this were true, then what you should do is effectively try to arbitrage away all the sort of inefficiencies in the world, such that everything just goes to saving the lives of, of people and having also as many people as possible, right? Because, because we all agree, the more people you save, the, the, the better, right? So these are all sort of consequences of this, as you said, uh, beguiling definition of utilitarianism of, of maximizing the good for the most people. So more people is better. And it's actually you know, e going to be easier to create a world where there's just a huge number of people where everything is, you know, the, the slums of Bangladesh or something. And everyone lives just in, in sort of a, a not great life, just above sort of the poverty line or something. And that is this, this repugnant conclusion that seems to sort of follow from the reasoning of the shell pond just now applied at scale. Now let's, let's dig into that because I think that's a little, um, might be hard for people to follow. It's this. It's a brilliant way you put it. Um, there's a utility, which is the economic jargon for well-being. So some people have higher well-being than others. Um, so I'm in the West, um, and I make a very good living. And there are people who are near subsistence and death. They're not just not as well off as I am. They have very very bad lives. So. That justifies – well, that's, let me say it a different way because this is the Peter Singer way, and I'll remind listeners that Shallow Pond is the centerpiece of his book, The Life You Save. We did an interview on that um, a while back. We'll put a link to it. So I want to throw a birthday party for my five-year-old. Well, that's immoral because that money – my five-year-old will be a little happier, but my five-year-old is already really happy. So making a five-year-old in America or Israel where I live now a little happier – compared to transforming the life of a five-year-old in a poor country is a moral imperative. I, I cannot 
have the birthday party if I'm a moral person. Um, I must use that money to buy a malaria bed net and save the life, say, of a five-year-old in in a poor country. And so the parfit reductio ad absurdum is that that seemingly, as you said, on the surface, you know, that's a, that's a nice idea. All right, you might even go to your kid and say, we're not gonna have a birthday party this year. We're gonna help somebody far away who we don't know, but who still has a very tough life and, and we feel obligated to, to help them if we can. But that the implications of that go much, much f further. Um, the, the example I gave recently in the conversation with Kieran Setia was, um, not only can I not have the birthday party if I wanna be moral, but I need to not spend time with my son. I need to be doing some consulting work because I can take that money and I can save 10 lives in, in that poor country with the malaria bed net. Uh, so even though my son will, will long for me and, and, and present perhaps a little bit my um, neglect of him, he, uh, his level of happiness will still be dramatically higher than the people who don't have the bed nets if they don't get them. So I'm imper it's a moral imperative then to get the bed nets. So I need to consult and ignore my son. So that's an example of that arbitrage. But to get to your punchline, you, you fill it in a little bit more, this idea of that everybody's going to end up fairly miserable, but there'll be so many of them, it'll be <laughs> worth it. Yeah, precisely. And I think that this this notion of, of arbitrage or trade is is really at the fundamental heart of it and treating morality like it's some sort of market where we can trade things. So if I have a certain well-being, right, um, my my well-being as someone who lives in the in the in the first world in, in the United States is probably sort of worth a lot in the sense that I could sell it to improve the well-being of other people really significantly, right? I, I, and I would only have to sell some of mine in order to substantially improve the, the well-being of others. And again, immediately that sounds, well, that doesn't sound bad. That, that in fact, maybe sounds kind of good. But then when you think about it as, well, when do I stop? When do I stop arbitraging well-being? And, and the answer is you, you never stop, right? If, if, you're, if you're really maximizing the good, Right, you should just keep arbitraging in, until until the cows come home. And what ends up happening is that everyone then ends up with a life that's only sort of just barely above subsistence level because everyone's been all the extra happiness has been arbitraged away, such that it's been sort of fairly distributed among everybody else. And if you if you note this this notion of arbitrage is, I think, so deeply embedded in the in the EA movement due to its inherent utilitarianism. Currently, one of the main funders of EA, saying, um, Sam Bankman-Fried, is a really you know, sm smart young man. He's now, he's now a billionaire. He's pledged most of his wealth to charity, which again is, I think, personally like an admirable move. But how did he make his money? He made his money in 2017 when the price of Bitcoin in Japan rose rapidly and outran the price in America, and he arbitraged the price away. And he was the one who did that really famous, one of, one of the most famous arbitrage trades of the last 10 years. And so, and, and, and that's where the money for the effective altruism movement comes from. It comes from arbitrage, right? So in a sense, you know, it, it really is sort of the fundamental uh, 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 mindset of, of the movement, which I, again, I, I have to preface, I think ends up doing a lot of good in general to the world. I just disagree with some of the more fundamental assumptions, particularly around this notion of maximizing. And Parfit calls, calls this uh, the repugnant conclusion. Uh, that's the rogue surgeon. It would be this, we're all in bo under borderline subsistence, but there's a lot of us, so the total is higher. Um, it's such a weird idea to suggest that, I, I don't know if any actual effective altruists would agree with this conclusion, uh, to be fair to them. The, it's a weird thing to me to suggest that let's make a lot of people, although it's it's a little bit implicit in long-termism, and Will McCaskill was recently on the program discussing it, it hasn't aired yet, so Eric, you haven't heard it, but it will hear it it'll oh, air by the time this comes out. But this idea that, well, okay, most people will be miserable uh, relative to the happiest people today. But there'll be so many of them that the total amount of happiness uh, will be high, higher than mm -hmm. this, uh, this uh, unequal distribution of well-being. And it does, it, at the heart of it, and there's a lot of this is embedded in economic policymaking and economics notions of social welfare and 
we may come back to this in a little bit to talk about it, but it, it implies a, an ability to add up well-being across people. And I just would add that, you know, Bentham, the father of utilitarianism, uh, despaired finally of, of that challenge. He couldn't find a way to add up happiness over people because it can't be measured. So part of the simplicity of these unscaled examples is, well, of course, a person should suffer with a, a dry cleaning bill to save a life. I mean, that's that's an obviously a good trade, and it is. And most of us, as you say, would, would do it voluntarily. We, we, we agree with, we, ex, we accept that moral imperative. Um, it's that the implications of that are, are quite unpleasant, potentially, and they have a different texture to them than, than that simplified example. Yeah, I, I, I strongly think that one, one big issue has been that moral philosophers, of, of which, for example, William McCaskill, it's, with his recent book, certainly is one. And in it, he discusses this repugnant conclusion. And he actually says that personally, he just bites the bullet on it and says, yes, maybe that is sort of preferable. But he also says, uh, you know, he's, he's understand he's not going to get everyone on board with that. If I'm remembering his book correctly, uh, he, he he has a sentence or two that says that. And, you know, I, I think it's funny because Parfit's original, uh, you know, purpose is to poke holes. It's, it's not it's not to say this is the actual end state of the world that you should work towards. Right. It's to say we can't possibly believe this moral philosophy because this is so absurd. Uh, and, 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 and the same goes for things like Robert Nozick's utility monsters and these other sort of famous esoteric um, attacks on utilitarianism. Let me read a, an excerpt from your essay um, that gets at this a little more uh, in a more colorful way, perhaps. Um, you say, quote, first, there's already a lot of charity money flowing, right? The easiest thing to do is to redirect it. After all, you can make the same argument in a different form. Why give five dollars to your local opera? And it will go to saving a life in Bengal. In fact, isn't it a moral crime to give to your local opera house instead of saving children or whatever? Pick your cultural institution, a museum, even your local homeless shelter. In fact, why waste a single dollar inside the United States when dollars go so much further outside of it? We can view this as a form of utilitarian arbitrage where you are constantly trading around for the highest good to the highest number of people. But we can see how this arbitrage marches along to the repugnant conclusion. What's the point of protected land in this view? Is the joy of rich people hiking really worth the equivalent of all the lives that could be stuffed into that land if it were converted to high-yield automated hydroponic farms and sprawling apartment complexes? What precisely is the reason not to arbitrage all of the good in the world like this and such that resources go to saving human life and making more room for it rather than anything else? The end result is like using Algis Huxley's Brave New World is a how-to manual rather than a warning. Following this reasoning, all happiness should be arbitraged perfectly, and the earth ends as a squalid factory farm for humans living in the closest to intolerable conditions possible, perhaps drug to the gills. And here's, I think, where most, util most devoted utilitarians or even those merely sympathetic to the philosophy go wrong. What happens is that they think Parfit's repugnant conclusion often referred to as the repugnant conclusion, is some super specific academic thought experiment from some called population ethics that only happens at extremes. It's not. It's just one very clear example of how utilitarianism is constantly forced into violating obvious moral principles, like we're not murdering random people for their organs by detailing the end state of a world governed under strict utilitarianism. Util then you end with utilitarianism actually leads to repugnant conclusions everywhere, and you can find repugnancy in even the smallest drop. Now, it's a little harsh, perhaps, um, although I enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> what would a utilitarian say? They're not they, – they don't – most of them – we're going to quote an exception in a minute, Eliezer Yudkowsky, but most of them are going to agree with you. They're saying, oh, no, 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 that's not what I had in mind. Uh, of course not. I don't yeah. believe rogue surgeons. I don't want to create hydro, hydroponic farms in Yellowstone and fill them with with uh, people having 10 kids, uh, 15 kids a lifetime. They don't really believe this, do they? Is this a straw man argument? I think that there actually is a reasonable sense in which it is a, a straw man argument in that I think that the average, say, say effective altruist out there who's donating some percent of their 
money to charity or is part of this movement, which comprises now, you know, thousands of individuals, probably does not, you know, need to bite the bullet of the repugnant conclusion or anything like that. And, and I sort of openly, you know, ad, ad, admit that. However, my criticism of the effective altruist movement is that many of the leaders, many of sort of the leading lights of the movement do toy around with the repugnancy that's inherent within utilitarianism. And let me give a brief example, which is William McCaskill's uh, latest book. And in it, he, he has this section where he talks about humanity's impact on the earth. And he says that, well, the normal moral view is that humans killing animal wildlife is sort of bad, right? Like when we clear a forest and make way for a parking lot, we kill a lot of animals and that's really bad. But, you know, McCaskill is able to sort of somehow personally calculate out the average suffering of animals. And he finds that animals generally often suffer. And he thinks that the suffering of animals outweighs sort of the, the positive aspects of being an animal. That is, if you had to choose between according to William McCaskill, not being born and being born a rabbit, you would choose not being born because rabbits often suffer. And so from that, you know, utilitarian uh, sort of notion, he then says that actually maybe we arrive at, quote, the dizzying conclusion that from the perspective of wild animals themselves, the enormous growth and expansion of Homo sapiens has been a good thing. And to be clear, what he means by that is that there are now less wild animals because there are more humans and their lives are worth negative value, and therefore it's good that there are less of them. I think that that is it both incorrect, so, so I, I, I quibble over all sorts of things, but I think it's a perfect example of sort of arriving at this repugnant conclusion of like, oh, you're, this, this rabbits, the average rabbit in this rabbit warren you know, has a negative utility, so let's just pave over it. Right. And that is that is a very direct repugnancy. Right. That's that's in, you know, a book that was just everywhere. Right. It was it was in New York Times. It was in The Atlantic. It was, it was sort of in the, in the lead of the movement. Right. And that's even a very on, like statement that most people would disagree with. Even on Econ Talk. But but those people. <laughs> yes. Those yes. People, yes. Most prominently. On Econ but but those people could be wrong. So I, first, I want to say that I've seen a handful of rabbits in my time, uh, probably about 50. They do look very nervous um, and, and uncomfortable, but I, I would not, for starters, I wouldn't be sure whether they'd wish they'd ever, actually, I find that amusing. I, I, I can't help myself. I find it very amusing to imagine a rabbit wondering if, if the rabbit should ever be born. Um, but what's wrong with that? Let's take it seriously. You know, you say it's repugnant. Most people would agree with it. Um, and, and rabbits are not maybe the best example because rabbits are, well, they're kind of a mix. They're cuddly, but they're not really that wild. So let's talk about something more, you know, dramatic, some megafauna like um, bears. And, and if we develop the West, Western United States more, there'll be fewer grizzly bears. And, and that's good because they have a very hard time. What's wrong with that argument? I mean, wh who, why isn't that a reasonable it, argument? And, and this is a real argument that people in EA give, I think, um, and, and, and hopefully I'm getting this correct and I apologize if I'm not, but I, I remember seeing that there was grant money at some point given out to figuring out whether or not killing all predators would be like a, the more moral act to do. Like we should get rid of all predators because predators, of course, eat prey and therefore cause, cause suffering, right? And that this is, this is like a possible uh, effective altruist cause area. So, so again, this is something that people take very seriously. And you're right that you can see sort of very initial sketches as to why, right? And, and those would be like, well, okay, so they do cause suffering. So, so, so what would be wrong with, with getting rid of all the, 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 the bears or something like this? And I think this goes to some of the failures of utilitarianism and that to deal with with sort of arriving at repugnant conclusions, I'll get to the why behind it in a second. It's often the case that utilitarians need to import non-utilitarian ethics, right, to sort of shore up the theory. And non-utilitarian ethics, you can have things like qualitative differences or natural order. Like you might, you might just inherently value the natural order of things. So you might say, well, listen, in, in, in a weird sense, the, the, the bear, the, the, the rabbit, the, the deer, they're all part of this larger uh, ecosystem, which is this natural order. It's where we come from. We sort of uh, 
owe it in a fundamental sense to leave it as 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 untouched as as we can. Like that doesn't mean you know we we need to bulldoze cities and put in rainforests, but it does mean that when we can, we should sort of let it run its its natural course. And actually, the moral thing to do is to let it run its natural course. But that's not an argument about suffering or happiness. It's not an argument about utils. It's an argument about say, um, just respecting nature, which is something I think most people have an inherent respect for nature and the natural order. And that's an example of a different, of, of a moral aspect that does not show up in utilitarianism because you can't really add it to any sort of calculation. Uh, you said utils in there. Utils are, uh, oh. in the early days of utilitarianism, was there was a hope in the economics profession in particular that uh, our job in life is to gather as many utils as we can, U-T-I-L-S. And um, ideally, if I have more utils than you, a distribution, a redistribution of those would make the world a better place in some, that being the greatest good for the greatest number of people kind of argument. And unfortunately, the utilometer never really got off the ground. We, we There's no way to measure my well-being relative to yours. We can maybe say something about my well-being today versus yesterday. My well-being before I eat an ice cream cone versus uh, after, although maybe an hour after, something different still. But there's, um, again, the hope so that we could make this whole process more scientific, this process of making the world a better place, which is at the fundamental root of morality, has hit uh, many walls. This is this is this is one of them, and I think it's important. It's a fascinating example because, for me, it's an example of our yearning for precision, certainty, and our and how easy it is to be seduced by it. And for a long time, uh, people hoped they could measure these things. And now, with the with MRIs and other things, the, the hope is re, is reunited. I mean, reignited. That that will sometime in the future be able to find out how happy you really are. Uh, and in my view, all well, these are, I think, an, a grotesque degradation of of the human enterprise, a misunderstanding of what life is really about, and over a worshiping of maximization that you've alluded to. But now to give the other side its due for a moment, isn't all this critique of utilitarianism and effective altruism, it's just an excuse to be selfish? I mean, come on. You know, all these people have come with these beautiful ideas for why you should give away more of your money, and you're just a selfish person, and you're just you're shooting holes in this to be able to feel good about not giving to charity. Yeah, I, and and I actually think that people should give to charity, and I think that um, that that's 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 sort of reasonable. Like 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 honestly, like I think that that is sort of a reasonable initial response because the question is whether or not there are any practical effects. Right to the to the repugnancy, right. So, so if if there were no practical effects, right, if this was totally almost like a metaphysical argument over the bases of this utilitarianism, then I think that that reply is really fair because the reply is just like, listen, none of this matters in practice. It's only in principle. You're mad or you dislike the in principle stuff, but you're just critiquing, but you're not critiquing anything in practice. So therefore, um, you know, really, this is just some. Uh, so some way to be, be selfish or get out of giving giving charity dollars since that's the impractice effect, right? And where I think, it, and I think that it's actually untrue that this is only about in principle objections. And let me give a very concrete example of something that effective altruism is the biggest spenders in. So, so it's it's the, the, the cause area that the EA movement is the only one giving money to effectively. And therefore their views are totally dominant, right? It's not like they're, they're, they're not the only ones giving out, you know, mosquito bed nets, right? Uh, but but this, this area, and this is the area of AI safety. And AI safety is, is now that we have these- Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence safety is that now that we have these, these artificial intelligences that look like sort of proto versions of what might of what science fiction has traditionally dealt with like real actual working minds in some sense and they're not there yet but they look like proto versions of it and so people have become very concerned about what will happen after we uh, after google and these other companies finish inventing these things um and one one question is is literally will they destroy the world 
And, and that may sound, again, very science fiction and very sort of ridiculous, but I think that there's some reasonable arguments to believe that this is a real concern. And we had Nicholas Bostrom on the program talking about this. Um, it's a lot of people are worried about it. Yeah. And, and, and again, I, I think very reasonably so. But again, EA is the biggest uh, funder, funder of this, of research into so-called AI safety and, and, and wondering what can we do about it and so on. So their views on this matter must necessarily have sort of like in practice effects, right? And let me give an example of that, which is that, again, in William McCaskill's latest book, when he talks about this issue of AI safety as a, a so-called existential risk, that is a, a risk that has the potential to destroy the earth and therefore we should take really seriously like nuclear war, right? Or, or something like, or like an asteroid impact, right? When he puts it into that category, the first thing he says is that, well, it doesn't really belong in that category because unlike in the, if, if an asteroid hit and killed everyone on earth, civilization would end. But if machines took over and killed all the human beings, civilization wouldn't really end. In fact, we'd have a lot of AIs and presumably those AIs, according to utilitarianism, maximizing the most good for the most people, are people. And again, think about how many that there could be and that, you know, it would be bad, but it wouldn't be as bad as, you know, humanity just sort of gets wiped out. And I think that this sort of thinking, this sort of sympathy for, for uh, you know, effectively saying that, I mean, if you want to talk about the repugnant conclusion, a future Earth, which is only AIs, well, you could fit a lot of AIs on Earth, right? Way more AIs you could fit on Earth than, than people, right? Uh, so, because you can just copy paste. You can't copy paste people. You can copy paste an AI. And, 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 and so you can just copy paste 10,000 of them, right? And you immediately, wow, we, we've, we've multiplied the well-being, right, by 10,000. And, uh, and I, th I really think that that sort of, in principle, sympathy of utilitarianism towards artificial intelligences shows up in how, what the movement funds. In that I personally think that we should be investigating legal and political ways to uh, come down hard on these companies via a public public debate and public representatives to craft laws that tell companies how and when to create uh, artificial intelligences, uh, particularly the really powerful new ones that cost millions of dollars to train. There's only a small handful of, of companies that are doing it. But the EA activists sort of ha have this, they, they really want artificial intelligence to exist. And uh, I, I feel like they're, they're naturally very sympathetic to it. And so they don't take sort of this anti-AI uh, movement seriously. They don't take um, the, the idea that maybe we should literally ban certain aspects of this technology in the same way that we've banned research into nuclear weapons and the same way that we've banned uh, research into creating artificial pandemics and other things that could reasonably harm a lot of people, right? We, we've banned them. But that is a huge, that is a slim, slim minority of the EA funding. Instead, it all goes towards, can we sort of enslave them in such a way to keep them safe and so on. Now, again, this is all very high-minded, right? So, so I'm not claiming that this is in practice effects right now, but clearly uh, it influences how the EA movement spends money in, in, in AI safety and McCaskill and others sort of sympathy towards effectively AI genocide. Well, I can only describe it as sympathy from that section of his book. Um, is 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 influencing the funding decisions. So I regret that we didn't talk about that when I interviewed Will. Um, it, I did read the book, but that didn't come up. Um, the part I'm puzzled about, and I'll think whether we should. I don't know if Will want to come back and try to defend himself on some of these issues. It might be interesting, but it's the greatest good for the greatest number of people. AIs aren't people. You you kind of. Fudge that back. I don't know if you're trying to be channeling your inner Will McCaskill, but they're not people; they're machines. But, I, but th there's this debate about whether they could, because they are intelligent, have consciousness. Um, and my view is, I don't think so yet. Maybe I'll be persuaded. Um, you know, my my view is on this is that if if a, um, a a vacuum cleaner that goes around your house on a track, not a track on its own mind, knowing not to bump into things. If it longs to be a driverless car, maybe perhaps it will have consciousness. I don't think it longs to be a driverless car. Now, maybe there'll be a day I that will come along and do that. And um, 
But is that the argument that because they'll be conscious, they'll be they should get moral standing? Yeah. So I when when I sort of conflated AI and and people, I'm giving the utilitarian perspective, um, which which I'm not sure why the utilitarianism necessitates this. I mean, you could sort of imagine imagine not, but let me just read read William McCaskill right right himself. So he says, in contrast. In the AI takeover scenarios that have been discussed, the AI agents would continue civilization potentially for billions of years to come. It's an open question how good or bad such a civilization would be. Even if a super intelligent artificial general intelligence were to kill us all, civilization would not come to an end. Rather, society would continue in digital form guided by the AI's values. And then he goes on to explain that the only thing the only the, the only reason he gives, I mean, I, I don't know what he personally thinks, but the only reason he gives, the, the reason he feels the need to emphasize about why that would be bad is that maybe during the AI takeover, bad moral values would be locked in for very long periods of time. He, he never says, yeah, it would be really bad because we would cause the human race to be extinct. And again, I think that this sort of like, this, this sort of what can only be described as some form of sympathy shows up in that the dominant um, funding for AI safety is basically to create AIs um, and to sort of, but just sort of to hope that we're going to be able to perfectly enslave them and that nothing ever goes wrong. And I, I really think that the other direction, which is to basically figure out ways to convince people to ban this technology and treat it like global warming and, and only do it under really uh, huge amounts of red tape and government regulation and public oversight, uh, that gets almost no, very little attention w- within, within EA. And so this is an example of a repugnancy within utilitarianism spilling down into like a, a f- funding decision. So again, so that it's still quite high minded, but that's sort of my reply to this. Well, there are no in practical in practice effects. I think that there are. Um, it's interesting to think about the role of um, religion in setting people's reaction to these kind of examples. I think most religious people would have no trouble saying that that's repugnant, that a world without human beings who were created in say in God's image would um, not be inferior to a world with, I mean, would be a world without human beings would be grossly inferior to a world that had lots of AI and no human beings. Um, I suspect the effective altruism movement is not a particularly God-centered group, um, for better or for worse, but I think a lot of people's repugnancies, repugnant reactions in these settings come from deep-seated religious uh, views, uh, which, you know, I think as a religious person, I think I should be open to the possibility that my repugnant reaction is is actually coming from my belief in God, say. Uh, the question is, if you don't believe in God, do you have an argument to reject a world of AI as a civilized world? A religious person has no problem with that. Even a person who's not religious but is affected by the zeitgeist that's still out there of, of something about sanctity of human life. And that's word sanctity is a word that implies some kind of religious uh, belief. It's an interesting question of, of if you don't believe in God, how do you reject those repugnant conclusions? It, it, it is actually, I think, an interesting question, quite an interesting one. Um, I had an essay before everyone sort of started talking about long-termism um, due to William McCaskill's latest book, um, I had an essay about long-termism and about the issue of keeping humanity human, such that I think that humanness, like, and by humanness, I mean something that William Shakespeare might write, right? <laughs> that humanness is like a moral quality in and of itself. Right. So, so, so just like maintaining the connection to our humanity seems morally important to me. And even if you could make everyone's lives better by putting a chip in their skull that stimulates their happiness center, let's be super reductive neuroscientists for a second, yep. stimulates their happiness center, I'd probably be against that because I would say, well, this takes us away from 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 humanness, from from our fundamental uh, being human, and this is an example of like a qualitative 
aspect of morality that I think most people have an intuition for. Sometimes that intuition is expressed religiously, but you could also, let me give a non-religious or relatively non-religious example of this, which is uh, Plato's theory of, of ethics, which is that things should act in accordance to their platonic form. They should act to their nature. So, so you know, a, a good man is a man who is the best of the men that he could be, right? And and similarly, a good, uh, you know, bear or whatever, right? A good bear is a good hunter, right? Because that's it's 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 almost like moral for a bear to be a good hunter, even though it causes suffering, because that's their nature, right? And and so similarly, in in this case, right, it would be that if humans sort of went extinct, that would be very bad, because what we value is the platonic form of, of, of humanness. That's what we are. And that's naturally what we value. And, and I think that these sort of qualitative aspects of morality can have either religious justifications or other sort of metaphysical justifications, but they're really just missing from a lot of the really core utilitarian uh, guiding principles of EA. And I was thinking about uh, Nozick's experience machine. We haven't talked about it in a long time in the program, but we had in the past where you have an option to hook yourself up to a machine and you will then program it in advance to have a bunch of experiences that you would choose. You could become a great rock star. You could become a great golfer. You could become president of the United States. You could cure cancer. Um, and the only problem is that you, it feels like real life. You go through this time on the machine doing these, having these emotional sensations from imagining them. Uh, they feel real to you, but they're not. You're lying on a table, and then at the end, you're, the, the machine's unplugged, and you're dead. And if you ask people whether they would like to live that life, which would be on some level exhilarating because you've it's all that chip in the brain stimulating the happiness center. Uh, it could be free of disease. It could be free of, right, um, your imagined life. Uh, most people, quote, I, I was going to say, most people would say that, that they would choose not to do that. But I think that conclusion is... Not as common today as it used to be. Uh, I, I hear smart people say, oh, yeah, I'd be on that machine. Uh, now, maybe they're, they get pushed into a corner, you know, you, philosophically, and they have to defend it. But I do think our world, maybe because it's less religious, I don't know. Again, a religious person would would not choose that, that life. Uh, and most non-religious people wouldn't, at least while religion hovers over our consciousness in some way, perhaps, unknown to us in the zeitgeist. But... I think increasingly, whether it's religion or not, doesn't matter. Uh, people are saying, yeah, that'd be good. I'm in. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think it's I think it's really interesting. And if I can sort of give give a reason as to why we should be skeptical of these sort of uh, the, these sort of like really seemingly disconnected utilitarian claims. And when I say disconnected, I mean from sort of the history of our civilization. So I think for the experience machine, if you went back and you pulled people during, say, Jane Austen's days, there's no way that they would, almost any of them would ever accept this, right? They say, this is, to, uh, maybe maybe you could find Jeremy Bentham right, right somewhere, but like you would never, the, the vast majority of people, including intellectuals of the day, would never, ever accept something like this. And, um, you know, th there's sort of this argument that it's very bad to top down design uh, economic systems or systems of any kind rather than letting them naturally evolve. Because when they naturally evolve, they sort of become like really robust and they capture all these things that you would never really notice when you're trying to top down design things, right? It's like, why, you know, like, why are things done in a certain way? It's like, well, try doing them some other way and you'll quickly find out why they're done in that way, right? This is a very classic phenomenon that people run into. And I think it's the this Chesterton fence argument. You, know, you think it's, you know, why the fence is there, but it evolved for some reason that you've, don't know of and you should start your default should be there's a reason it's there and i don't understand it yeah I, I, absolutely and i think that you can sort of apply the same thing to morality irrespective of uh, of religious beliefs right so you can say listen we're most of the people reasoning and talking about this stuff are sort of coming out of Western civilization. It has sort of certain values and assumptions. We should sort of take our intuitions seriously as things that have evolved over very long periods of time. And this sort of top-down design 
from like utilitarians where let's just calculate everything in terms of utils and we can just arbitrage everything, right? It looks a lot, it, lo it looks like top-down planning of morality, right? And, and I think that there is a sense in which we should, we should trust our, our sort, of the sort of the ancient wisdom, even if we can't immediately uh, give some sort of justification that's, that's satisfactory. And maybe there's a sense in which the, the, the number of people who would now go into the experience machine or something like that shows you know, that we're somehow disconnected from, from, from the values from, from where we came. Yeah, it's ironic. You said morality is, is not a market, but you're kind of suggesting <laughs> there's something market-like that emerges rather than from the top down, from the bottom up through centuries, millennia. Of course, as I like to point out, even though I'm a big defender of, of laissez-faire and emergent order, uh, in a certain, in certain, uh, up to a certain degree, um, there are a lot of things that emerge that are not attractive. We had racism as a defensible, self-righteous view for a long, long time. It's Absolutely. It's justification of slavery and so on. So it, it's a little trickier, but but I think that's um, it's a good – what you said, it's a very good starting place. I want to go back to one thing we we, we talked about, and then I want to transition to the um, Eliezer Yudkowsky quote because I think it's very, very interesting. You know, when I asked you, isn't this just an excuse to be selfish – uh, this, these critiques, the answer I would give is that it's, it's an excuse not to give to people far away from you where you don't know how the money is going to be spent or what its impact is. And of course, there's unintended consequences that you as a Westerner do good or think you can control and you don't. And we have uh, tragically large numbers of examples where people with lots of money thought they were making the world a better place and they weren't. So for me, it's all about local knowledge. The reason you should give locally isn't because you care about, more about your kid than you do about the kid in the poor country who needs the bed net. It's that you can actually find out what the effect is. You can see that your kid's happy. You can see that your local community center that you've given money to is actually functional rather than dysfunctional. And I think it's a, it's a variation on the reason I just thought of it is the point you're making about bottom-up versus top-down, that one of the virtues of bottom-up and emergence – is that it utilizes that local knowledge in a way that the top can never do because it can't have access to all the information that's a bit, that would be needed to make those decisions. It goes back to the socialist calculation debate of Hayek and Mises against uh, Lang and I forgot who the other side who else was there. But um, let's, um, let's, let's turn to this uh, fantastic quote from Eliezer Yudkowsky. He says the following, quote, pick some trivial inconvenience like a hiccup and some decidedly untrivial misfortune, like getting solely torn limb from limb by sadistic mutant sharks. If we're forced into a choice between either preventing a Googleplex, a Googleplex of people's hiccups or preventing a single person shark attack, which choice should we make? If you assign any negative value to hiccups, then on pain of decision theoretic incoherence, there must be some number of hiccups that would add up to rival the negative value of a shark attack. For any particular finite evil, there must be some number of hiccups that could be even worse, meaning one person has a hiccup. Well, that's a trivial effect. But if billions of people have hiccups, that the sum of that is so horrible, it outweighs the sadistic shark attack that's unbelievably horrible way to – it's a death and a, a very horrible death. Um, it's – again, to quote the last line, for any particular finite evil, there must be some number of hiccups that would be even worse, end quote. Your answer is no, there isn't. Why not? What's wrong with that argument? Uh, I of think Elias it comes Yudkowsky. down – Yeah, yeah. Um, I, and, and first I want to say also that, that Yudkowsky has, I think, been presciently correct about other issues. So just before I go on to, say, criticize this, this brief thing, I'm, I'm not really – criticizing him him fully in any sort of sense but I, I really don't agree with this and the the reason why is that I think it, it it's implied by the basics of utilitarianism and what 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 that does is really treat good and evil as big mounds of dirt so it's it's, it's all sort of the same like it's, it's just all, all dirt and there's a certain uh, amount of the dirt that you have and say, this is how moral philosophers talk. They, they talk very reflexively about like big historical <laughs> events. But let's say, uh, let's follow their example for a moment and, and, uh, and say that you had, you had a moral amount of evil dirt that was the Holocaust. And it's this huge mountain of, of evil dirt, right? And you say, well, when a human being, you know, stubs their toe or, or hiccups or something like that, it's like this little speck of, 
of, of, of dirt. Right. But if I, if I like let humanity go on long enough and just started adding up the, the stub toe amounts, eventually I would have a mound of dirt of these stub toes that is equal to the, the Holocaust. Right. So one sort of, you know, it's, so it's, it's like, literally they want a mathematical equation that says a Holocaust is equal to X number of, of stub toes. And I think Again, this is something where I think most most people sort of get off get off the bus at, at, at some point around here. But uh, I, I think the reason why is that good and evil just aren't big big mounds of dirt. Like the, 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 they're they're just not. There's all these sort of qualitative differences between various types um, of evils and goods. And similarly, you know, um, uh, you know, just as 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 stub toes don't don't add up to a Holocaust. You know, no number of of uh you know warm socks that you put on adds up to someone someone saving a life right these just aren't really comparable uh things and and the problem is is that what utilitarians want to do by max by this process of maximization is arbitrage between everything so you can see you can see how this repugnancy happens, right? They conceptualize everything as mounds of, of dirt, and then they want to arbitrage and trade between all, all the mounds and treat everything sort of the same. And then you end up at sort of this, this, this terrible place, this repugnant conclusion. And that, I think, indicates that there's something really deeply wrong with viewing good and evil as essentially big mounds of, of tradable dirt. Like, they're not tradable. It's not fungible um, in the way that they want it to be. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. And I think it's it's extremely important in practical terms for economics and economic policy making because economic policy making is fundamentally driven by this kind of, of thinking. Uh, when North American the North American Free Trade Agreement was under consideration, um, one of the examples that was often used is that there was a town in Illinois where a lot of brooms were made, and uh, if NAFTA were passed, that town would, would disappear. A lot of the people who work there would would go out of business because the Mexican brooms would be much cheaper than the than the American brooms, and the economist answer is, and by the way, I'm a I'm a big believer in free trade. I, hope, I wrote a, a book, The Choice, about this moral issue, and I, so I don't think this is a good. I, I'm in, I'm in favor of free trade, but I do not think this is a good argument for free trade. But this is the economist argument. Often, not often, always, the argument is there will be millions of people who will save $2 on a broom. And when we add up that benefit in dollars, and this is not utils, this is dollars. We add up the benefit in dollars uh, that they save, and then we're gonna take, against that, we're gonna have the the, the 5,000 or 3,000 people in the town who lose their jobs. They're gonna be unhappy for a while. They would pay something to keep their jobs, but uh, the gains are enormous uh, of getting rid of those, those broom jobs in America and letting them go to Mexico. Now, as a footnote, I looked into this, and it turned out a lot of the workers in that factory were um, Mexican who would come by bus to make brooms in America. And what would actually happen is they would go back to Mexico, and we could debate whether that's good or bad. <laughs> but, but, but that wasn't under the, under the conversation. The conversation was millions of people will save a dollar, say, and a few thousand people will lose $10,000. And the calculus is clear, says the economist. And when you press the economists, they say, well, of course, it's not really true that the country's better off. The broom buyers are better off a little bit, and the broom makers are really savaged. But there's enough gain to the broom buyers to compensate the broom makers so that the net amount of well-being in the country goes up. And therefore, free trade makes Americans better off. And that calculus to me is morally bankrupt. And if you use it with anybody who's not an economist and say, but the people who gain a dollar adds up to more than the people who lose their jobs and lives are ruined. They're going to look at you like you're crazy. And they're right because that moral equivalency re requires a commensurability, a measurability and, and, and having this metric that is totally wrong, right? As if well, what would you pay to save your job? Well, I don't have a lot of money, so the answer is not very much. And this other person who's really rich is going to save a dollar on their broom, and therefore that's I mean, that's just that is insane. But I taught that for a long time. Uh, I taught that that tariffs and quotas are inefficient, and they are by the economist's definition of efficiency, which means that the pie as a whole gets bigger. But at the fundamental root of that is to me a moral failure 
which is to suggest that it's average well-being that counts or average willingness to pay. That's absurd. It's absurd to compare those across people. It is it is grotesque. And yet every economist listening to this is trained that way, as far as I know. Maybe, maybe at George Mason, you, you get something a little different these days, I, I hope. But in general, that that is mainstream economic thinking. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting and I think sp specific example of this because I, like like my my first thought in this is some sort of qualitative moral difference where I say like e someone losing a job is not the same really as them losing x amount of money. It's actually right. it's actually worse, right? In, in some worse. sort of fundamental way, right? <laughs> and and you lose yeah, your dignity. exactly. Exactly. There's like human or, or, or I mean, it, it makes me sad to maybe say that our platonic essence is in work, but maybe in terms of our platonic essence is in responsibility of some kind. Right. And nowadays that's that's often work. And and therefore, this is some sort of violation of it. And again, we see. So so what's funny is that we have these ancient moral systems and they actually do a pretty good job. Right. Like like here we have, you know, Plato's notion of platonic forms, which you would never think is you know, like the, the best ethical theory of all time or anything. But actually, you know, in this case, it, it kind of gives you a pretty sensible answer and puts its finger correctly on, uh, on, on, what, um, on what goes wrong, or at least one of the things that goes wrong. And, uh, and again, I think that there's sort of this severing of, of what one might call ancient wisdom, I guess, um, from, you know, contemporary utilitarianism. And this does show up very occasionally, but it does in sort of the practical effects of EA. But, you know, with that said, I also want to at least ha have a moment where I acknowledge some of the really cool things that, that, that the effective altruist movement has done. And I think that where they have the advantage is just that they are doing very, they're treating things like charities that people don't normally treat as charity. So as an example of that, the AI safety movement, which is trying to make you know, the world safe for AIs, they treat as a charity. So they say, okay, this is a charity cause. It's a very unusual charity cause. People would never normally think of it that way. But, uh, but by treating it as a charity cause, we can actually raise a bunch of money for it and we can distribute it. And I think that that's very cool. I think more more weird things should be thought of as 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 charity causes and the expansion of the notion of charity uh within the ea movement to incorporate things like uh things like that or other things that i agree with so for example william mccaskill has an interesting point where he says you know we should probably leave some coal in the ground because coal is really accessible and easy for civilizations to start up again with. And if something ever happened, like we had some sort of civilizational collapse or some sort of new dark ages, then if there was no you know, energy left in the ground that was easily mineable, it would be very difficult to restart civilization. So he says, maybe like a weird cause area for, again, a weird area to do charity in would be like buying up coal mines and, and making sure no one mines them, which is both good for, for dealing with climate change and good for maybe we can, we can just in, it, it, we have it in our back pocket. If we ever need it as a civilization, we have some coal uh, and, and we can sort of redo the industrial revolution. And that is again, sort of like a crazy, a, a crazy thing, but it's a fun and, and I think interesting <laughs> expansion of the notion of charity, right? And and so that's where I give uh, effective altruists uh, sort of a lot of credit is sort of expanding this notion of charity to incorporate maybe like more almost science fiction or or ambitious or weird things. And I think that that's good in general. Yeah, I just want to reiterate on my broom example that that I think Americans should be allowed to buy brooms free of duty and quota from Mexico. <laughs> I just don't think that argument that was made is a good reason for doing so. Um, as an economist who's become increasingly critical of my field, when I hear non-economists criticize my field, I always go, that's totally wrong. They have no idea what they're talking about. My critique, it's deep and sensitive and nuanced and, and it's based on blah, 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 blah. Now, you're not a, you're not a philosopher. You're a mere neuroscientist. Uh, don't philosophers look at you and say like, oh, you don't really understand utilitarianism. We, we've, we've worried about all these problems forever. We understand them. We have good answers to them. These are cheap shots. These are, the, these are things I say about people who make fun of economics often. That's a cheap shot. You don't really get it. What kind of response have you gotten from, if you've gotten any, from serious philosophers about your essay, especially people who like effective altruism? Yeah, so I, I think one, to, it, when dealing with really interdisciplinary issues, first of all, I think it's very difficult to 
to say where the boundary is of what academics should should contribute to. I, I do agree. I think I think philosophy is the most easy to sort of jump into and, and criticize field, and therefore it gets sort of a lot of uh, a lot of flack in that in that manner. Um, I, I I am a neuroscientist, but I my main subject of study is the science of consciousness, which is an inherent very philosophical field. So I'm relatively familiar with the philosophical literature, at least at a broad level. But the point is not to say, uh, uh, not to say that that's very relevant. I, I think what's more relevant is if you look at the statements of the people who uh, sort of espouse this philosophy and you look at their academic papers. So, so you look at like the, the, the academic more reasoning behind these moral arguments. What you'll find is that there is no universal not, not even just universal, the, the repugnant conclusion remains a huge topic of constant debate. And people are always trying to come up with new, clever ways to deal with it. And they're always failing. And you can look at many of the leaders of EA and look at their papers. And what's strange is that they'll admit this in the academic papers. But then when they go to publish like a popular book, right? It's suddenly that sort of ambiguity. It's still there to some degree. Like I'm not claiming anyone's covering anything up or anything like that, but it's just, it's not emphasized versus the predominant conclusion of a lot of these academic papers is we have no idea what to do about these problems. And let me give a very brief, uh, a, a read, which is that, um, you know, here, here, here's, here's someone who, this is an academic paper from someone who is uh, head of this FTX foundation, which is this effective altruist foundation that has a lot of, of the money. And uh, here's, here's the ending of an academic paper. In summary, as far as the evaluation of prospects go, we must be willing to pass up finite but arbitrarily great gains to prevent a small increase in risk, timidity, or be willing to risk arbitrarily great gains at arbitrarily long odds for the sake of enormous potential recklessness, or be willing to rank prospects prospects in a non-transitive way. All options seem deeply unpalatable, so we are left with a paradox. This is on dealing, this is on basically trying to make utilitarianism work for uh, calculations that have really long odds. So sort of like extremes of calculations. And he says, oh, we're left with a paradox, right? So, so, so this isn't so, sort of a uh, you know, yes, maybe people within the suit will be like, oh, well, it's not an important paradox, right? Like, but, but, but when you read this literature, what you come away with is, as so much of academic philosophy is, is that it's a bit of a mess, right? But other, and that's fine. That's fine. I'm not, I'm not criticizing the, the moral philosophers, but, but it, it exists for, for example, in my own field, philosophy of consciousness, it's, it's, it's a huge mess, right? But, you know, they don't have billions in funding. Right. So it's just it's just the case that the standards are going to be higher once the word billions, you know, enters the picture. Right. And I think that that's relatively fair to, to, to want really like firm, firm answers and a firm dealing with these issues. Um, sort of if, if, if you're saying, well, the way that we're giving away all these billions is justified by this moral philosophy. And then when you look into it, you're kind of like, well, this is this is a bit of a mess. Well, in economics, it's the same thing. Right? When an economist gives a seminar or writes a workshop, or writes a, an academic paper, there's lots of caveats and 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 by the ways and footnotes about, well, we did it a different way and it came out this way, not quite the same way we did in the paper that's in the mainline conclusion and so on and so forth. And it's thoughtful. But when they write the op-ed about it, not so thoughtful. And I think, you know, it's a human impulse. We want to be paid attention to and nuance is not as attractive as certainty and self-confidence. So the uncaveated version is often what gets the most attention. And so a lot of times you don't get all the caveats. Um, now, ha having said all that, and we're pretty tough on effective altruism, you, know, you, you argue at one point toward the end, it, well, okay, so they, they, they soft pedal the utilitarian underpinnings and basically what the movement could be and should be and maybe really is, is simply eh, try to do good with your money. And that's a good idea. I'm all for it. Uh, I think you're probably all for it. Uh, is it really so important that these intellectual underpinnings outside of AI, <laughs> which, which is <laughs> horrifying, which is troubling, but um, is it really that important? Is, is eh, eh, To really say it dramatic, you know, maybe fairly or unfairly, you know, they've done a lot of good in the world, you could argue. Um, this movement, and they've encouraged people to give a lot more charity than they otherwise would. 
they may have encouraged some people to, to go into into running hedge funds who could have been doing something else, who but were motivated to because they could give a lot more money to bed nets. There might be a few moral issues there, even in its own practical way. But you could argue that overall, the effect of altruism movement has uh, encouraged lots of good things in the world. Yeah, and and you know what, I I totally. I- I totally agree with that, right? I, 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 I'm, I'm very sort of open about it, and I mentioned it at several points in the essays that I think on net, it's, it's certainly done good, and I think in general, it's a relatively admirable movement. Um, you know, this, this particular essay was, was prompted. Um, one reason why I wrote it beyond that, I, I was getting constantly, given how much has been in the news, I mean, constantly getting sort of asked my opinion about it, um, is that there was sort of this, this contest that they offered about like, give us the best criticisms of effective altruism, right? So then, of course, I wrote a very critical essay. But I, uh, but, but, but I think that the, the, the criticism is actually does provide like a path forward. And I think it, it goes into this notion of expanding, expanding the idea of charity, right? So my ideal sort of effective altruist project is, is, is something like, um, you know, let's go out there and we'll mine an asteroid and, and, and we'll give all, give it all the charity. Right. And, uh, this, this is sort of, this is purposefully exaggerated as a project. I don't really expect anyone to do this, but sort of like that, the ideal case would be something like, we're going to go, we're going to mine this asteroid for charity. But in the process of doing that, right, they have to invent all sorts of new technologies and fund like a new space center and, and come up with all of this and like put money into the space industry. And everyone's watching the YouTube videos of the rockets going up. And it's like, why do we actually like it? It's not really to give the money to the charity. The reason we all like it is because asteroid mining if you actually saw it happening, would be really like fun and exciting to see, at least for a certain type of person, they would really get a big kick out of this. I know I would, right? I'd be on YouTube looking at the videos of the rockets going up. And I I just kind of want us to be like honest about it, right? That there's a sense in which the utilitarian calculation of like, well, in the end, we'll get the money to give it to charity is sort of this fig leaf that we can put over the cool project. And the utilitarian calculation really isn't necessary for a lot of this stuff, right? Like you, you almost like don't even need a calculation. And an example of this is that, you know, they're actually giving out a lot of money to something that's that's near and dear to my heart, which is writing online, which I think more and more people, more and more writers should start doing. Um, and, and they're giving out, you know, serious money to this. And I think that that's great. And I don't think that you need to have some sort of calculation of saying, well, is giving a blog $100,000, which is what they're saying they're going to do, somehow worth actually the equivalent of dozens of Bengalis being supported for the rest of their life or something like that. Um, I think we can sort of just put aside those utilitarian calculations. And in many ways, the EA movement already does that, right? So, so again, but it's just, it's just a, it, my, my, the, the goal of this criticism is not to deflate the movement or say that it's terrible. It's just to sort of try to nudge it away from what I view as really sort of this core repugnancy of utilitarianism that comes from the fact that this grew out of moral philosophers and more towards sort of less caring about that sort of stuff and editing that stuff out. And I think that will also make the movement appeal more to quote unquote normies. I think I would add is that I think it's a good idea to give a fixed amount of money if you're, that you earn to something other than yourself, uh, whether it's 3%, 5%, 10%, whatever you commit to is a nice thing. And you should try to do something good with that money. Um, and you should be humble about the good you can achieve, which I think is, is would be my other criticism of this movement. There's a certain lack of humility, a certain hubris about the science. You, know, you said, you know, save so many... Bengalis out of poverty as if we have a, a way of doing that, right? Helping people thrive, helping people flourish requires more than money. And we've, we've spent hours on this program talking about the challenge of poverty in both in rich countries and poor countries. It's really hard to do. A lot of times there are unintended consequences. So, you know, my motto would be um, check to see what your money is actually achieving try to avoid harm. I wouldn't say necessarily first do no harm because that might really buy you toward not giving very much. But I do think you should try to have an impact with your with your dollars, but I don't think you should be overly uh, confident that you know how to improve other people's lives. I don't think we know very much about that. And that's why I think local giving or giving to causes that you think might get at root reasons for people having a challenge to, to flourish is, is, is very powerful. Um, so, I look forward to talking about this more um, with its proponents. I'm sure they'll they'll be here to answer some of of your um, 
of your criticisms, Eric. I'm, I'm curious, are you going to stay in this area or you, is this a uh, ongoing interest of yours? Is this a passing thing? Um, uh, what's next you, for you? you know, You've written you know, a novel. You're going to write some more novels. What's, what are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to one day r r write some more novels. I feel like novels have to be really necessary, though. Uh, you have to feel you have to have written it. Um, you know, for, for, for my Substack, I, I cover a lot of topics and I sort of do deep dives into various ones uh, generally once a week. And, uh, and, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I generally return or cycle around certain issues, but oftentimes I'll then go on to, to do, uh, you know, uh, the, the next post will be have nothing to do with, with effective altruism. Um, and I view myself as basically just an essayist, uh, in this capacity where the goal is just to write really interesting essays that hopefully also like in, in, inform people, but also hopefully are sort of uh, like, like, like well-written and provide some sort of aesthetic satisfaction. I mean, I, and I think that that's, that's actually missing a little bit online. I think sometimes people just want the bare bones of stuff. They just want the facts. They want the bullet points. And uh, that's not really my style. So that's what I can hopefully add is some sort of combination of the two. My guest today has been Eric Hoyle. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's, I hope, an effective altruist, small e, small a, but not with the capital letters. Eric, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Uh, thank you so much, Russ. This was such a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.